Good afternoon and welcome to Inside Story. Inside Story is a weekly magazine program produced by the Agency for Public Information which highlights government's plans, projects and policies at work in your community. The first year anniversary of the opening of the Argyle International Airport takes center stage on today's edition and will bring you a status update on the Diagnostic Center at Georgetown. Stay with us. Our program continues in just a moment. Our natural history includes the long-tailed white tropic birds that migrate to our skies and rock faces, the North Atlantic humpback whale that comes to our warm waters to give birth to and nurse their young, the critically endangered hawksbill turtle and the St. Vincent parrot, these are all creatures that the National Trust seeks to protect for future generations. For more than 40 years, the National Trust has worked to save St. Vincent and the Grenadines' most beloved places, landscapes and seascapes where great moments of history took place. We work together with communities to value and protect important pieces of our cultural community, national history and environment, such as the series of decorated Salvador pots found in Clear Valley, signifying that St. Vincent's civilization is almost 2,000 years old. We do this all because the next generation needs to know our stories, as they will only inherit the places and species we choose to save today. We urge you to plant a tree under whose shade you never plan to sit. Join the National Trust today. Thank you for staying with us. Welcome back to our program. The Argyle International Airport, the AIA, is into its first year of operations since opening its doors on February 14, 2017. The airport is being serviced by regional and international carriers and is disclosed by Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzales there more in the offing. Inside Story tours the newly opened Interpretation Center at the Argyle International Airport with Prime Minister Gonzales on today's edition of the AIA One Year After. continues with Prime Minister Gonzales on site at the Argyle International Airport where we tour the newly opened Interpretation Centre. You hear the departure the hall. You see this mahogany here? Yes. At the roof, this mahogany, it was cut specially selected and cut oh, okay. and put to cure for five years five. until we were ready for it and all of these the, these markings in green here on the departure and on the arrival you'll see blue yeah. this, these markings are really for to show the, the, the flutter of the trees and the breeze and the and the blue would have been for the sea and the green here for the trees. Um, and, and when you go to the front of the building, or sorry, the, the, at the arrival side of the building, outside, and you see the stones. The stones are, uh, the stones are from here and it's a mark of the resilience of the Vincentian people. It's symbolic of that. Um, and the very design of the roof, you know, it, it's kind of like that, like for the waves. And at the end, it's like two, two um, uh, seagulls, the wings of two seagulls. Um, and it, it's, it's really beautiful. In, in fact, it, it, it took into account our sensibility, our sense and sensibility. And of course, the young people in painting that beautiful mural of our history, students from the community college. All that is, is what gives this airport meaning and life as reflective of us. You know, and that's, that's it's full of love. And then, as I have said, it's a metaphor for what is possible. Well, this mission statement here at the AIA Interpretation Center 
So it's a, it's a beautiful center which you will see when you go in, gives the history of the construction and where from whence we, we came. The mission statement of the interpretation center and many airports all over the world have interpretation centers. Right. Some people call them information center, but they're really interpretation centers about the, the structure itself, the history of the airport. And the mission statement, the Argyle International Airport Interpretation Center is intended to educate Vincentians and visitors alike about the sacrifice, commitment and hard work of the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the support in cash and kind from many friendly countries and institutions in helping Vincentians to fulfill their long-held dream of having an international airport. It, it, it relates to many of the things we have been talking about. And, oh, this is a, this is a beautiful painting. It's by Dinks Johnson. This is a gift by Dinks. This shows you what the air, what the, the Argai looked like prior to the construction. You have photographs. But this is the artistic eye of one of our premier artists saying this is my gift to the nation. This is what I remembered the, the Argyle site to look like. Just beautiful mountains there and remember the, the altar, the, the, the road before and you go down along the 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 seafront. Ah. Breathtaking to say the least. Memories, memories. Mm -hmm. We have to remember. And um, this is where it all started, Prime Minister. All started. This is the beginning. And and this beginning it's you know, at one time they were saying that we didn't even do an environmental impact assessment. You notice I presented it in Parliament, I showed you what you had. These guys, the critics, you know, they, they told so many lies, so many untruths. They tried to mislead the people. If it were not for strong, determined leadership, supported by a determined people, there would have been no Argyle International Airport, you know. This is the 2005 address which I delivered. Um, the Methodist Church Hall. The Methodist Church Hall. Is your friend, the late Jeffrey Cato. Oh, Jeffrey Cato was phenomenal. Jeffrey was involved in two big projects. Well, several, but two which made a great difference to the people of this country. The first one, north of the in the North Windward with the the Rabaka Bridge and certainly he was the man the, the, the main Vincentian engineer on the project here we have Chavez President Chavez when he when he came uh, I had on a hat at that time too but a slightly different one um, Uh, I remember this one, oh, one the, Prime Minister, the, uh, the, the town hall meeting. Basically. Yeah, I had two of them, two town hall meetings with the homeowners. It's um, it 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 was a both of them very interesting events. <laughs> Right. And, and you spoke, Prime Minister, earlier on at, uh, about the relocation of, uh, of the church. Uh, and, 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 and we have evidence of right, it here. All of that is this is the first day when I raised the flag of solidarity. That red flag people said that the, f that the red flag is, is a ULP flag. But there's, no, there's nothing ULP on it. The August the 13th was Sir Vincent's birthday and Fidel Castro's birthday. 
and I chose that date in deference to both Vincent for his guidance and his strength along the way with me and this project and of course Fidel. Professor Leonardo Perez and then other ministers of government we see stalwarts like Montgomery Daniel and Clayton Bergen and of course Cess Mackey and, and the, the constituency rep for the area, Frederick Augustus Stevenson. See the reclamation of the land. When we're reclaiming land, again, that was a subject of criticism. It's amazing the number of persons, including parliamentarians from the opposition and their hangers on. They considered themselves export engineers. They wanted to tell you how to build it, how not to build it. I mean, it's incredible. And of course, they had some of their experts, some engineers who didn't know anything about airports, who knew about general engineering, but who politics took precedence over their professionalism. And they talk a lot of things they didn't know about. And then the petroglyphs. You know, making sure that the petroglyphs were retained, that we, we preserve them for posterity. It held up work on the airport, you know, because we couldn't do work up in that area for two years plus, waiting, going through all kinds of solutions. And we had, Egyptian archaeologists. Then, of course, they came. They came with um. Then came the and other people came, and then eventually the Argentinians. This is the May 2008 when the equipment came along. You know, they said the critics of the airport had said that I'm lying. They, these equipment wouldn't come because they were supposed to come in January. I said, okay, so they're delayed. No true fault of our own. And when they turned up, they said, why you have to show them off? But they were saying they were not there. They were not coming. So I said, okay, that's what you said. I will show you that they're here. And then when we showed them, they said some of they said this is second handing paint over when they were almost all new pieces of equipment that served us well during the construction. The early phases, the airside facilities. Ah the spanning of the Yambu River, which was a quite an engineering feat. With the Cubans and the Mexicans being very much involved in that. Uh, AIA Oversight Committee, members of the board of directors of IADC. Look at the quality of members of the board of IADC who oversaw this the construction. Rudy Mattia, Sims Martin, Julian Francis, Vincent Beach, Jeffrey Cato. Godfrey Pompey, Glenn Beach, Corsell Robertson, Victor Hadley, Gerald Thompson, Brent Bailey, Morris Slater, Everett Bess, Joel Jack, Gard Saunders, John Peters, Rochelle Ford, Camillo, Desri Millington, Robert Hewitt, Keith Francis, Bernard Morgan, Dexter Samuel, Adolphus Oliver, Jasmine Dean. I mean, people of great expertise and importance and, and um, experience. Uh, it, it's, it's, these are the people who I relied on. Good quality of incentions and we owe them the gratitude.
and of course these four presidents were very important well two, three presidents and one prime minister patrick manning my dear friend chen shu bin president of taiwan chavez and fidel then we had to do this new highway cost us six million u.s dollars then all the archaeological work to help in our history helping the reinterpretation of our history all the artifacts which we have found preserving our heritage um, the catholic shrine that beautiful catholic church we had to the church gave us permission to demolish but we had to we built another beautiful one for them and these all these artifacts are here and in in the incorporation collaboration of the st vincent grandis national trust see all the pieces here the contributory fund of vincentians overseas and and other vincentians locally here made important contributions the caricom development fund um this is oec oecc peter chung to 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 deal with the terminal building the this is the turning of the sod at the terminal building. Um, oh, this this was a wonderful day when we came to visit in December 2012. And my friend Jeffrey, whom I remember with great love. You know, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Cato had come here, this gentleman, Abbot Pereira of Mount St. Benedict. You know, he's because they're, they're told to see what the situation is with the church and this oh Ramel Oliver who succeeded Jeffrey Cato, brilliant young engineer with all the, the asphalt plant and the concrete batching plant. Um, and of course we had all the tours on the site and the runway and taxiway with the asphalt concrete and here's where the apron is finished with the hydraulic concrete uh, aircraft rescue and fire equipment the control tower the cargo facility and of course there are a lot of people who assisted with cooking food during the the construction, this is a Cuban cook who is helping to feed the Cubans. It's a lot of visits, it's, it's, it's real, it's, this is something very beautiful. The, the opposition were invited all the time to come, other political parties. The NDP didn't come during the construction, they preferred to have a lot of false things said. But Anisha Batiste, of the Democratic Republican Party asked for a tour and, and uh, she was given a tour. And other, other, other persons came by. Uh, Prime Minister, this is a very interesting facility that is the Interpretation Center. Um, I know it's not really officially open yet to the public, but I'm sure after after our, our, our visit here, lots of persons would want to yes. see the history of the airport. The, I know that the AIA has identified someone to be in charge of the interpretation center and to provide tours for people um, and generally to make sure that it's kept in good condition. But this the most important question. Uh, February 14, 2018 is fastly approaching a year after the opening of operations here at the AIA. What happens after this? Well, we continue to, to build on, on this facility. Um, this facility, it's an event in itself, but very importantly a means to the ends of social economic development and uplift of people, creation of wealth and jobs throughout the economy to help with fishing and agriculture and tourism and business. This is what this thing is about. And we are on trajectory very much. 
I am sure that people are going to want to celebrate one year. Um, we can't do anything on the 14th of February because I've noticed it's Ash Wednesday. So we're probably going to do something on February the 13th and we will, we will advertise it. Well, Prime Minister, let me take this opportunity and thank you for taking this journey with us at the Agency for Public Information one year after. Uh, congratulations to all those persons once more who are involved in this magnificent project. Uh, we continue to enjoy its beauty. We continue to enjoy all that it has to offer. Until next time, good evening. Our program continues in just a bit with a status update on the opening of the modern medical complex in Georgetown. Rosie, it? Do you hear the people on health board say, at least all these snacks could cause hypertension? You love watch money, eh? But no, Rosie is not a doctor. I'm concerned about the kids' health. Nothing is wrong with our children. They look very healthy. Rosie, let me tell you something. Let me start. Read the food labels and choose less salt. Okay, honey. So what are we going to do? We're going to read, read the food, food labels and choose less salt. Salt. The silent killer. Cut down on salt. In our second presentation, the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment recently visited the new modern medical complex at Georgetown. The project, which is principally financed by the National Insurance Services, along with assistance from the governments of Cuba and the Republic of China on Taiwan, is scheduled to open its doors soon. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez and Minister of Health The Honorable Luke Brown visited the center to assess its readiness for operations. Here's more. Medical complex, and we're I'm in the presence of two very powerful men right now. On my right is the Minister of Health, and on my left is the Prime Minister. Um, we're in the dialysis room, and they're going to give me their equal perspective on the modern medical, what we're what we've achieved so far, and what does that mean for Vincentians. So I'll start with the the man on the left. Well, uh, all power to. Luke, you, you, the you, said, right. you said two powerful men, but I want to give all power to Luke because he's the, he's the minister who is completing this project and he's doing very well. You're the prime minister. Well, the, <laughs> the, as Brother Laborde, who is doing the finishing here, the, the, the technical heavy, um, he tells us that we have 280,000 square feet of floor space. We are having some very important addition to the delivery of health care services. First of all, right here where we are, this would be the first state-operated dialysis facility for persons who have acute kidney problems. So this itself, right where we are, is, 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 is a very significant innovation. This is the making. Yes, this one. And then we have an area, a significant area for accident and emergency when that is operationalized. We are going to take about 35% of the pressure on Milton Cato Memorial Accident and Emergency. Because this area will serve basically from Bayabu to Fancy. 
which is about 40,000 people. So that the, the waiting time down at Milton Cato Memorial, which a lot of people complain about, though throughout the world you have long periods of waiting at accident and emergency because is what it says, accident and emergency, and a lot of people go out there who are neither involved in accidents or in emergencies. But that is how life is. So that is a very important uh, area. We're going to have out here, a, for the first time, a small operating theater. We're going to have specialist diagnostic work and treatment work for ophthalmology. We have a, an excellent lab, the facilities here, both in itself for the 40,000 persons, but to do work, which Milton Cato Memorial would also send for us. So it would, it would help Milton Cato in that regard too. We have an intensive care unit here with the facilities for four beds. Milton Cato has two. A 200 room hospital, they really need four. So that you can see that when some persons were down there, go past there, the critical period in IC, rather than send them on the wards, even though you may feel that perhaps should keep them a little longer, the demand is such there. So you, you may send here. Um, or you may, in fact, bring them here in the first place. Then there's an area which was not originally set out for oncology to deal with cancer patients. There's a lot of space. And the chief medical officer and Donna Bascom from the, the, the hospital administration, they are of the view and with the PSA to Common Secretary that the space could perhaps better be utilized by by putting the oncology unit there so they, you have the chemotherapy facilities, lots of space there. Just to be an area to deal with certain acute patients, but <coughs> acute ailments, but they have enough room to cover those those areas. So all the critical areas of health care. All the critical areas here. will be covered here, plus some. What we have in um, at Milton Cato, the plus will be, for instance, the the dialysis facility. Now it is important to grasp this. The the the, 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 the problem of persons with cancer is a real expensive thing. So to dialysis. And people have to go overseas for chemotherapy. Though we have chemo down at the hospital in but also for radiation, and we'll have to up it here also for radiation. The cheapest place is, is Guyana, but you'll have to go for six weeks, eight weeks sometimes. Trinidad and Barbados, expensive. Though no, Cuba is not as expensive, it's still a challenge. Guyana is the cheapest. So we can have here that particular addition. So you can. You can do from accident and emergency, all the lab work. Um, you you oh, can you, you you have the, the, the pharmacolo pharmacological work. You 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 have ophthalmology, seeing about your eyes. You, you have surgery. You have the the, the medical um, internal medicine um, analyses, diagnos di diagnostic work. And this here will be linked to the Georgetown Smart Hospital, which has about 20 beds or thereabouts, which will provide the support with beds for here. Even though you have beds here too, but, but it's here, there's so much diagnostic work which is going to be done that you, you link it well with that one so that you 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 may end up having something like 20 little bit 
beds here, when you have 20 there, there's a huge number mm -hmm. for a facility, for facilities of this kind. And this is, frankly speaking, a revolutionary step forward in the delivery of health care. It's a huge addition to the health infrastructure. Of course, we have to thank the government and people of Cuba. First of all, Fidel. And, and when it opens, I will tell stories as to how they started <laughs> and the relay with it with, with, with Raul. The Cu Cuban foreign minister came here and with me broke the ground several years ago. Um, the, and then, of course, we, we got monies from, we borrowed monies from the NIS, we used some of the central government funds too. Uh, and over the period of time, we simply made sure that we have it, we have it accomplished in, of a very high quality. Of course, the critics may say that it could have finished earlier. But, you know, we have a whole saying up here, and Lucas talking about it, or how about Nabil goodness? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a goodness. <laughs> sure. This is a goodness, and and the the there was there were some challenges beyond our control in relation to some of the the the, the time. So we're expecting a grand opening. Well, hopefully, Luke and I were talking about it. We'll have to talk to our cabinet colleagues maybe sometime in March because. The wonderful little things to to be done, but all about showed me he has to put in some um he had to put in the the some things for the laundry. He has to so the pump, he has to put in some stuff, some furniture has to come in, some other pieces of equipment, and then the place has to be cleaned. The, 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 I see the painters are around doing some finishing touches and so forth and the road. Braxa is building the, fixing the road. And, and, and the parking lot. And the parking lot and the, the, the outdoor facilities. And I'm hoping the, when we have any management here, because a deputy hospital administrator is going to be here to control the whole complex, including the Georgetown Smart Hospital and this, that we make sure that these beautiful spaces where we have plants and flowers, the facility doesn't look drab. We we'll pay attention to the environmental aspect. Of we have to pay attention to all of those um, things. So it's 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 in short, simply a magnificent facility. And you're pleased with what you've seen so far. Very pleased, and um, I must say, since Brother Laborde has come on, he has done a lot of work. Even though, as he says, that he has been here before, and we have to thank. Mrs. Myers, and we have to thank Ray Duggan, who are here all year doing work, and all the people who, who, who contributed, mainly workers from around this area, in, in, in North Central Windward and North Windward, who, who, who built this along with our Cuban comrades. So it is, a, it is yet another manifestation of our friendship. Cubans in Vincent and Venice. And of course, we are going to have in the budget this year, we are having 40 something staff members plus 22, 23 Cubans who are coming in additional under the, the program which we have. So, health is being placed as a priority? A serious priority. This is a, this is a major. Um, infrastructural addition, no question about it. What we have to do also, I was, I was speaking to the Chief Medical Officer, um, Simone Kiza Beach, that we'll have to get additional ambulance services too, and of an appropriate kind. I hope Stuart Haynes is hearing me at the NIS. <laughs> I'm coming to the NIS for them to buy one. <laughs> a good and enlarged one where you know we, we 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 have we got some from Taiwan and we we are pleased with them but 
as always, we, we, we have to up the game. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, PM. Thank We're you. happy for the, the emphasis and the importance that is being placed on health of our nation because a healthy people is a wealthy people and our minister has been working hard in that regard. Very much. Congratulations, Minister, so far on the work that we've been able For the last few weeks, He's been coming up here almost every day. <laughs> almost, he's almost like a contractor now. <laughs> because the cabinet was on his back. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to Haiti for the CARICOM meeting, intersessional, on the 25th. I'll be away there for three days, maybe. And um, I told him normally I was going to take him, but I told him, no, he can't come. He has to just to stay here so that we can open this in next month in March. All right. Sometime in March. Minister, you are time to respond. Well, PM, just to say thank you for the confidence, first of all, that you've put in me and placed in me in relation to the appointment to such an important portfolio, especially at this critical juncture of uh, the life of, of health in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And uh, as a result of that, I've had the responsibility for more or less seeing through uh, an important vision as far as where we could take St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this modern medical complex is a very important component of that vision. Uh, what we have here, as the PM, the PM has outlined very clearly what we have here in this facility in terms of the vastness of its scope, in terms of the services that will be provided here, in terms of the staff that would be on hand to take care of that service, those services, and it's something magnificent waiting to happen, especially when we understand that it would help us to really go further along the road of towards achieving that ideal of universal health coverage. Well, so you are also looking at uh, medical tourism because in terms of what you're looking to put in, it would be attracting persons to come here to receive healthcare services as well. Well, surely we look into medical tourism, but. One of the things that we got to flag because as the Prime Minister pointed out is something that never happened before in our history is that through this facility we'd be able to provide dialysis services in a public space for the first time in St. Vincent. That is a big development. We understand the significant cost that dialysis represents for persons and we know that most individuals who have faced the problem of kidney failure in the past essentially we were grappling with something that was almost like a death sentence. So we have changed the situation for them in a fundamental way and that is something that should be celebrated. And the Prime Minister, not content to leave it there, has obviously signaled an intention to make some major strides in terms of oncology. Because uh, when you look at those two issues, when you look at our statistics, you, you see, and we signed a, an agreement recently for a capacity building project in relation to preventing and control diabetes. You realize that diabetes and non-communicable diseases, you know, lead to various kinds of problems that we'd have to contend with here. Um, diabetes, which is a big problem in this country, has led to persons having kidney failure and needing dialysis. So, so this is a part of our capacity building in a sense. So we, we're very happy we are now looking to make arrangements to, for the finalization of this building. Many persons in the past few weeks have played a role. The Prime Minister has mentioned some. He's mentioned the work which, which has been done by Elliot Laborde here, you know, who, was, who occupies a substantive post of site architect, but who has essentially been managing the project recently. And uh, we, we have other stakeholders who have come on board. We have Vinnec, for instance, that helped us with the uh, installation of a generator recently. So when we were in these final phases of development, we have CWSA that has been helpful in a number of respects. And different state agencies have, have basically chipped in. Even National Properties assisted when the Permanent Secretary made a request of them for some assistance. And we have Braxa very importantly now assisting with access roads and assisting with the, the car park and they have been working diligently and dutifully with respect to that. We are now in the process of making sure that well, we, we see that the dialysis unit here has already been the set up. The entire wing actually we, is set up. We had, a, we had a test case, the entire wing is set up. We had the folks come in from Renal Dy Dynamics to do it. So this is now basically ready and to go. And staff been trained. Uh, precisely. And actually right now, 
there are several components of the service that several services that we could begin to offer uh, at this facility. We are really at a very good place, uh, an exciting place, and a place that, that represents, a, as I said in Parliament, uh, a great jump you know, for health, and that's going to equip us to better deal with this fight against disease and you know, sickness in our country. And that is something that is almost a sacred part of what any civilization should should be taken care of. But right now too we have Braxa, they're doing the road work. I think that they will be able to, to settle that shortly. And you see there's a the possibility for great integration, integration of facilities, integration of this facility with the smart hospital and even the clinic. One way in which we could make the integration more complete is perhaps by having a uniform color code, you know, in the paint in the in the paint in the building. But more than that, you see, I mean this is this is a hospital that could that is excellent in its own right and that could attract a lot of interest. I mean you raise the point of the medical tourists and but even beyond the medical tourists there's a concrete possibility in relation to medical schools too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, offshore medical schools that are here that could be able, that could be able to to basically one of them had a, had indicated that they wanted to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so one medical school has already indicated that they wanted to be here. That is that is serious. That is that is not only medical benefits, that is economic with the economic benefits as well tied up there. So this facility is strategic from the standpoint of achieving health and even economic objectives. You know, if you take into account <coughs> the twenty odd Cubans who are coming here, they're gonna have to live in this area. It means rents. There are a lot of people who are gonna be coming here for one service or the other. It means that the restaurants around the area are going to make money. This here is, a, is, a, is an industry, is a, is a, is a small industry mm -hmm. which you're going to have. I mean, Milton Keto Memorial is a big industry of over a staff of 600. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but this one is going to be intimately connected with, with this community. I want to say this additionally. We have built in recent years, three polyclinics, 24 hours. We have equipped one and it's operational, the one that stops. We'll be doing so shortly in Mespo and the Manbukamen. This is in addition to the 39 clinics which we have had before and during our time we have done several of them. Um, we, we, have, we have just done, rebuilt really, the Mental Health Rehabilitation Center, uh, a new facility. 4.1 million dollars. Absolutely. Then That's a figure? 4.1 million dollars is the cost of the, the work that was done on the Mental Health Center. Okay. Then, then we have what was done at Milton Cato Memorial, nearly six million dollars. We, we fix up the ICU area, the kitchen, we, we did the female wards, um, we, we have done work down at pediatrics, uh, we did operating theater, we put an additional operating theater. Mm -hmm. um, then the entire wing down there for pediatrics, per children, persons between birth and 21 years, in conjunction with the World Pediatric Project, we had some some assistance too from the Musty Company yeah. through the Musty Charitable, Charitable Trust. Trust. And the OECS has declared Milton Cato Memorial to be the center of excellence for pediatric care in the Eastern Caribbean. People from all about come here. They have provided already WPP um, for, the, for our country and the region immediately over $100 million. In, in, in service since 2002. I'm not talking about a component, I'm talking just days alone. Um, and critical health care for, for persons between birth and 21. Critical. Um, so all of these things are what we have seen in the addition to the health infrastructure. And we have just last month finalized the consultancy for the designs, for the acute um, uh, hospital, 
the acute referral hospital, the 130 bed out at Annisville. It will take about 18 months or so to do the designs and to, to, to give us a plan for every single room, what equipment we're going to put in it. The World Bank is financing that part. All I need to know is to have a target number which I have to work with for the construction and equipping so that I could start on the road and looking for the money. And so that these are major additions. Quietly, okay, I, I, know, the, I know the complaints about this or that. And I, and, and, I, and I hear that. And the, 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 the one you get most is about medication, pharmaceutical products, tablets, medicine. This year, we have $8.3 million in our budget for materials and supplies that is under the, the central medical stores which deal with the pharmaceuticals. And a person may say, okay, you have that, but do you spend that? In, in 2016, we spent $8.1 million. And 90% of what you, the prescriptions you, the doctors write, are filled. But if somebody doesn't get one set of tablets down there, they make a big noise. Whereas, and when they fill a tablet, when they fill their, their prescription, as in 90% are filled, it's $5 they pay you now. $5, even though it's 100 $120, $150 worth of medicine. And if you ask them to pay another $5 for something else, though they, they're not, you, you hear the noise, mm -hmm. how the hospital is wicked, but every single morning, they will buy juicy <laughs> for the children. So that's an issue with all of these things which we have to talk about soberly. In 2001, there were 51 medical practitioners at Milton Cato Memorial. Today, we have 90, nine, zero. You had 15 consultants, 14 or 15 in 2001. Now you have 20. The specialities have broadened, widened, deepened. And there, is, there are good news to talk about health. But you have a few blowhards who just pick out the one or two problems which you have. And more opportunities are opening up for specialist areas in health. And then the training of nurses and doctors, and so on and so forth. Now one of the things uh, that could perhaps be mentioned too as well, PM, is that the Pao has an idea that this facility could also be uh, a place for preventative, you know, a, a preventative approach. To health, you know, and for it to be more or less uh, an area where we we try to tackle non-communicable diseases with some preventative measures. So, so we hoping that that takes off too, and it will take off it because this year, as we could see from what we've said already in this interview, is going to be a big year for health. We have this facility. We're hoping to open polyclinics soon. There's work being done on smart hospitals. Um, well, there's what the smart hospital was done done here in Chateaubriand. We're hoping to have another smart hospital in the Grenadines. We're looking to do a smart hospital, which uh, in Union Island, and also for the Mayo Clinic to benefit from that project as well. So there are those things happening, and we we have very important. It's not just a matter of investing in infrastructure. Human resources is important, and the prime minister already. Yeah, and indicated. remember, you, you, we, we did, we did the, the hospital, we fixed it up in Port Elizabeth, and we rebuilt it. Oh yes, we, we just, we just. There's so many things sometimes you forget. <laughs> True. But how are we going to manage the staffing, minister? Well, staffing is something that we have. I mean, first of all, in terms of nursing staff. We have a pool of nursing, of, of trained nurses that we could draw upon, consequent upon the government policy of more or less financing education by providing stipends for those who would otherwise not be able to afford training. And we're investing in other areas of training on the several projects, including the modernization of the health sector. The point I want to make too, because it's, 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 important, uh, it's an important matter that 
is an outgrowth of the public policy of the government in health that we've just launched a health and wellness commission under the leadership of Dr. Timothy Providence. And that commission is going to be tasked with looking at some of the preventative aspects of things as well. So, so that commission and its work is going to be integrated with what we're doing at this facility. So we don't want you to just come here at the end stage. You could come here at different stages of your problem and receive appropriate guidance relevant to your particular stage. Uh, that's, that's something that is, is important. Of course, the Wellness Commission would deal with other there will be other things that are part of its mandate, including what we do through the schools and what we do in some other areas to make sure that physical activity is integrated properly in schedules, to ensure that we, we teach you know, appropriate eating habits and other behavioral practices consistent with what we want to see for the health of the whole population. When we come back, we journey to the Argyle Roman Catholic School to hear the views of the students and teachers on the Argyle International Airport. Protecting our marine environment Our forests, our wildlife for our children Pollution of our rivers and beaches Deforestation and overfishing threaten to destroy our biodiversity. Protected areas are set aside by law to protect these fragile ecosystems which provide us with water, food, electricity and recreation. Tobago Keys Marine Park, Kingsill Forest Reserve and Milligan Key Wildlife Reserve are examples of our local protected areas. Be inspired and help preserve what is naturally ours. Let's Protected areas protect life. A message from the Environmental Management Department and the National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. And finally, on a lighter note, the pupils and teachers of the Argyle Roman Catholic School have their say on the Argyle International Airport. Here's more. Coming. Are you happy? Yeah. Happy plane. We are happy. We are happy for the airport. And here with me today is Mrs. Suzanne Boye, the principal of the Argyle Primary School. Now, seeing that you're so close to the airport, we would like to know the transition. What was the transition like? No. The, about two years ago, the students, we, we did a choral speech, um, which was called Taking Flight. Now, this choral speech, it, capsulate, it capsulated the, the whole event, the whole experience with the children, with the building of the airport, what we experienced and everything. Now, it stated that we were here from the beginning. When the ground broke, we were here. The students sang when the, 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 um, the new road was opened, but little did we know that we were the ones taking first flight, moving out. We were here, the children experienced rivers filling up, mountains coming down, and then they saw all the tractors, the bulldozers, doing all that and it was fun for them until the wind started to blow. So Mrs. Boye, now that the airport is open, have you taken a tour with the school? When, when it was open, a few students, we were invited and I was happy that the same students who experienced all the hardship, you know, they got a chance to see the opening, to be part of the history of the opening of the, the airport. Um, I think now looking back, the price we paid was small for what we have there now. Beautiful building. And you know, we were there, we experienced the first flights, and now we have the jets and so. The students are so much in tune now. They could hear a song and know. Teacher is the, is the merry jet landing. Initially, we, 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 we gave them the chance when, when the jet came to run out and look. You know, I told it, the teachers it was okay. It was a new experience for them. But now they, they have grown accustomed after one year. So they no longer 
run out. A few still do, but you know we are not that affected by the the the, the song and so forth. We, we have grown accustomed after one year. Um, have you gotten a chance to visit the new airport as yet? Yes, please. What was your favorite part about the visit? The international arrivals because in there is so cool and nice and I really like the design. Did you get the opportunity to fly on a plane to anywhere? Yes, please. I flew on the twin auto plane to Mustique. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I really liked it. What was the whole procedure like? Check, check in and everything. Was that good for you? Yes, please. Uh, what you say you like the design of the airport. Which part of the airport is your favorite design-wise? The part that marks up the Aga International Airport and says that the airport was built by the Prime Minister mm -hmm. on the land grass that is going up to the VIP section. Okay. Um, were you in school during the building of the airport? Yes, please. Um, did you have any challenges per se what, during that? Yes, because the dust was affecting us and we had to move from here to Bayabu. That didn't spend a long time and next we went to Calder School and that lasted about a whole term. Was transportation, did it take you longer to get to the new location? No, well, Miss Boy arranged the van for us to go up to the school. So I just walked out by my gap and they and the van came and picked me up and carried me up to the school. Okay. How do you like being back in this um, <laughs> building? Yes, it's very nice and they also equipped us with new windows, mm -hmm. the board windows and the Frederick Stevenson gave us a parking lot in the back. What would be your favorite place to visit? Australia. Why? Because I really like the kangaroos, the way how they jump. And I heard that there's a giant plane there, Airbus. Mm -hmm. So I want to see that plane. Okay. Would that be your dream plane to uh, fly one day? Yes, please. 
sometimes when the big jets come in, I just be very excited to hear the noise and when they land in. I just take videos of them every day when they come in. What do you think about the international airport? I think it's very good and I love to see when the planes take off. Have you ever visited or traveled from the airport? Yes, I visited the airport when my grandmother was going to Barbados and I've traveled in Caribbean Airlines to go to And on this note, we've come to the end of another Inside Story program from the Agency for Public Information. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, you can view this and other presentations by the API on our YouTube and Facebook page. On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Dion John Hez wishing you a wonderful evening and a pleasant weekend. Until next time.